Stephen Gray Ministries. This morning's message was powerful for me. I hope it was for you. Um, to understand God's purpose is to form me into his image. And that that image is the image of a creator. And if you remember, we were talking about that process. We were talking about the obstacles. And one of the biggest obstacles to being formed into God's image is ourself. The old nature, our self-life. And so tonight, I want to touch on something a little bit different, but a subject we've covered before. I want to talk to you about the way of the cross. I could say the process of the cross. You know, spiritual growth, actually, let me, let me say it this way. Every believer, every person who gets born again has a twofold purpose. That first purpose, Part of that is to get saved. It's to believe. It's to be justified before God. But then the second part, or you could say after the believer becomes saved, the next part that he has to embrace is the part of sanctification. Amen. Where we're going to be formed into God's image. We're going to be, and as we're formed into his image, we're going to be separated from the world. We read in many verses, such as Romans 8, 29, which says, For those God foreknew, he predestined to be formed in the image of his Son, that he, meaning Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's you and me. Hallelujah. Each of us are those brethren that Jesus has planned to form us into. And that's really a repeat of Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and where it talks about God making us in his image. And we know the church's main function is to get people saved and then to help them grow spiritually. And it's such that even in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, Paul is rebuking the Hebrews for not growing. Listen what he says. For whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Interesting verse there. Unskilled in the word of righteousness. It doesn't say the, the Bible or just scripture. It says unskilled in the word of righteousness. And we've talked in here a lot about identity, and you all have all begin to embrace that and start to study that and start to go deeper into that. But it's interesting here that Paul is equating immaturity, babes, to those that don't know the word of righteousness. To those who are still trying to prove their value instead of accepting the truth. And I know that was a big part of my life for many years. Most of us are used to religious churches where there's not much truth taught in terms of spiritual growth, nor discipline practiced. Spiritual disciplines are the key to spiritual growth. God will grow us. The Holy Spirit will grow us as long as we give ourselves to him and cooperate with his purpose. You can't learn to hear God and follow the Holy Spirit unless you embrace the purpose of spiritual growth. Because that's what he's trying to do. That's his, that's his mission. That's why he's been put inside of you. And so if I don't embrace that purpose, if I'm trying to hear God say, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? He may not be speaking because that's not his purpose. And so once I embrace spiritual growth, I find God begins to speak to me in a whole lot more meaningful and deeper way. So let's talk for a minute about 
what causes spiritual growth. We find that process explained through the statement or through the process of the cross. You've probably heard we've talked in here a lot about the cross. What does the cross mean? And so I'm going to try to get it to a very uh, bottom line uh, so you have some real sense of what is God is doing in your life. We find that the process of the cross involves three things. Death, you got to have death but to start the process. You got to have somebody to die. You have to have death. You have to have resurrection. And I'm happy to say there's a third aspect called life. Death, resurrection, and life. Now, Romans 6 through um, really verse chapter 8, but really Romans 6 through verse 13, 6, 6 through 13, goes through a process where Paul is showing us this process very simply in Scripture, Romans 6, verse 6, and he starts off with this, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Now, the old man in that statement is the old nature. It's the nature that's passing away. The old nature has been crucified with Christ. He says we must know this. But then he goes on to say that you not only have to know it, verse 11, but you have to reckon, the word is used, or that means to act on the fact. So know you've been crucified, but learn to act on the fact. I want to repeat that. Learn that you have to act on the fact of knowing that you've been crucified. How many know they've been crucified? Okay, now you have to act on the fact. Okay, so it means you've got to do something based on that fact. Okay, so what is it we do? And that takes us down to verse 11, or I'm sorry, verse 13. Here's how you respond, or here's how you act on the truth that you were crucified with Christ. Once I identify with Christ's resur uh, crucifixion, I act on that. How do I act? Verse 13 tells us, do not present your members, that's your body, your eyes, your arms, your legs, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God. Yield to God. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Look what verse 14 says. For sin shall not have dominion over you. How many of you have struggled with sin? How many of you have got something, maybe habits or something of that nature? Listen, the way you break that is to yield or present yourself to God. Hallelujah for the cross. We love the cross. We know we've been crucified with Christ. But we must act on it by presenting ourselves. That means being open to being yielded to God. That's what gives us the victory. Many of you may remember me telling the story of this whole process where I was asked to be a clown. And I love the story, because every time I start talking about the cross, that, that picture comes to my mind, that story, where I had two, two friends, a couple, who were ministers, and they were running child evangelism. Um, if you're familiar with that ministry, it's a great ministry. I think a lot of the Baptist churches have them. Uh, child evangelism. And so they were doing a big, they do a big booth every year at the fair. And so they said, well, Steve, would you help us? I was uh, on furlough at the time from Africa. And they said, would you help us um, with the child evangelism at the fair? And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. And I thought, you know, I'll be, I'll be leading kids to Jesus. And, you know, they had a really good little book they used. And I said, yeah, I'll be glad to help with that. And so I, I showed up that night and uh, found out that they didn't want me to lead anybody to Jesus. They didn't want me to talk to the kids. They wanted me to be a clown. And my job was to draw the kids into the booth. And so I remember I'd, I'd traveled a lot that week, and uh, the kids were all really young. And I was up in my office about 4 o'clock, and I realized I was so tired. If you've ever been so tired, I was literally, like, shaking. And I, I said, if I could just get, my office was upstairs, if I could just get down the steps and get in my bed, I'm sleeping for weeks. 
And so I, I made my way down the steps and I got in the bed and I laid on the bed. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired I couldn't even go to sleep. And as I'm laying there so tired I could hardly move, I remembered, I'm sure God prompted me, that I had volunteered to be the f clown at the fair tonight. And I'm laying in the bed and I'm trying to rationalize how I can get out of this. And I said, well, number one, I know it's, it's God's will that we evangelize and, and especially children and so I also know I've given my word to these people that I would do this and so I've, I've been to quickly realize I couldn't get out of this so I'm laying in the bed and I knew I knew there was power somewhere wasn't sure where but I'd, I'd taught on this stuff and I'd seen this and I knew there was power but man I didn't feel it it felt like it was a million miles away and I'm laying in the bed, and I, I heard the Lord say this very, the Holy Spirit spoke this very sweetly. He said, are you going to keep preaching and teaching about this, or are you going to learn to live in this? I was like, oh. So I sat up in that bed that night. I sat up, and I grabbed the dresser, and I pulled myself up, and I got my keys and my wallet. I went down and got in the car and drove over to the fair. And I walked inside. I must have looked like a zombie. And I said, I'm here. And they dressed me in the clown suit. And I didn't get a picture of it, but I'm sure it was a hoot. Had a horn in the whole nine yards. And I danced around and honked the horn and drew the kids in to the booth. And about 9 o'clock, you know, they released me. And so I went back home, and everyone had gone to bed. And I'm downstairs in our house there and we had a TV down there and I was watching TV and it was in a rocking chair and I was I was just doing like this just rocking and the Holy Spirit said what is that <laughs> and I looked down and I'm just patting my feet I realized uh, it's just like I had nervous energy and and it's like the Holy Spirit said where has that come from and I was like, whoa, just a few hours ago, I was dead. I was in the bed. I couldn't move. I was exhausted. And yet now, I couldn't go to sleep because I was filled with this power. And the Holy Spirit said, that is resurrection power. Yeah. That's the power. Power to energize you, to fulfill you, to do whatever it is God's called you to do. And the Holy Spirit said, but most of my church is still laying in the bed. That's what he said. So I said, well, I guess we better get started then, huh? Notice when I'm in the bed, I didn't feel that power. But I had to, by faith, recognize that that power's there. You felt that power. You've been moments where God's energized you, where you've been maybe exhausted, or maybe you just didn't feel... Uh, led to do something or anointed to do something and you started doing it and you felt the anointing of God come on you it's amazing when you sit like I do with some some weeks I have three messages to prepare if we have a school and so um, sometimes God will say work on this message well guess what if I try to work on this message there's no anointing on that that's what I call living in the resurrection living in the power of God. And that power comes when you yield yourself to what the Spirit desires you to do. So don't just know about the cross. Don't just know about the fact you've been crucified with Christ. Learn to act on that fact by yielding to what the Spirit desires. And as long as you yield to what the Spirit desires, He will give you the power to do anything. That's what the cross is about. And every time, this is what's really cool, every time you're sitting in your chair after you've been exhausted, patting your foot because you went with the clown in the fair, and you're feeling that, that power of God, you begin to realize something, that I am proof, I, what I'm feeling is proof that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, was resurrected, and now I can appropriate that power in my life but it requires faith to believe it requires a willingness to act death means you're yielding to God's will that's what the death is about 
I'm dying to my will and I'm yielding to God's will and God's power. Not my own will. And so there, once I embrace death, I can then enter in to my resurrection or to Christ's resurrection. Resurrection is the belief in the power of God to do his will. Resurrection is the belief in the power of God to do his will. God, resurrection is God's process of energizing you to do his will. That's what the resurrection means to us. And the key, here it is, the key to the power of the resurrection is faith. Faith is the key. How do I get this resurrection power? You must enter into faith. Faith. Faith is heightened when you yield to God's will. Why? Because you may not see the fruit yet, but you feel the power. The power is a faith builder because you go, yes, I feel that power. I feel that energizing. But look, self will blocks the resurrection power. Yielding to God's will brings it in. Self rising up blocks resurrection power. And many of the tests we go through in our life is God showing you about resurrection power. God teaching you how to live in this power. He, he, he puts obstacles in your path. He makes you volunteer to do things like be a clown in the fair. And then he wears you out. He orchestrates all this. He wears you out. And then he has you realizing, oh, I can't move. I can't. I'll have to sleep for weeks. He puts you in those places where you know, I can't, I can't do this in my own strength. And then he opens the door and says, will you have faith to believe? That there is resurrection power out there. Yes, I've heard it in Sunday school. Yes, I heard them talking about it in church. But until you use your faith to appropriate that, don't work. It's not there. Your faith brings it into fruition. One of the greatest examples of this in Scripture is Peter in the boat. I love that story. They're in storms, spewing. You know, he's already, they've already missed the test. You know, he said they had a test when Jesus was feeding the 5,000. He said, you, you give them something to eat. And the Bible says in John 6, 5, he did that to test them. And they failed the test. And so he gets kind of frustrated at them and says, just go get in the boat and get out of my sight. That's the Steve Gray version, but that's kind of what it says. So they get in the boat, and they're out in the water, and the storm comes. And don't you know, whenever you fail the test, there's a storm coming. Why? Because it's another chance to get this right. So next time those storms roll in your life, just hallelujah, Jesus, bring them on. We're going we're gonna to pass this time. I remember one time we were in Africa, and Ann was with me. We had a bus of about 15 people. We're going through, Lord knows where it was, some back roads or something. Everybody's complaining. Where are we going to sleep tonight? Where are they taking us? And Ann stands up and turns around and says, well, I don't know, but I'm gonna, not going to complain because I'm passing this test. I don't want to take it again. <laughs> That's a true story. So we have to realize that God tests us in this. And so here they're in the storm. Peter's in the boat. And he sees Jesus. He's not sure it's Jesus, but he thinks it's Jesus. And he yells out and says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. Now Peter's impulsive and, and kind of a, probably a pain. I'm sure the other disciples are like, oh God, here comes Peter again. But he, he's smart enough to know, Jesus, tell me to come. That was very wise on his part. He didn't just jump out of the boat and say, oh, Jesus, I'm going to him. No, he said, Jesus, tell me to come. What is Peter exercising? Very simple, 
faith. He knows that the faith we live in must have a word from God to activate it. Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come. Jesus says, come. Peter says, I've got all I need. And so what does he do? He steps out of the boat. Now here's the cool thing. He doesn't get the power in the boat. Some of you are sitting in the boat going, where's the power? If you'll give me the power, I'll step out. It don't work that way. Faith does not work that way. You'll never live or enter into resurrection waiting for something to hit you to give you the motivation. That's where faith comes in. You must raise up your leg and in the storm and reach out and step down on the water. Now, what if I sink? What if I get wet? That's where faith comes in. You have to believe that when I step down on the water, I'm not going down. When I step down on water, there's going to be something there to hold me. I'm standing on the Word of God. And so I step out of the boat, I step on the water, and then I go, whoa, this is working. And so then I pull the other leg over, and I say, now I'm walking on the water. Wow, this is really cool, Jesus. Jesus, I'm coming. And about that time, a wave in the wind smacks you in the face. We had a lot of that wind and wave, or not wave, but wind, last night. That's what hit Peter. And he turned his focus. Is anybody listening? What do you think the devil's testing you for? To get your focus off of the Word. To get your focus off of the Word. What was the Word God gave you? Stay focused on that word. And so the wind hits him, the wave hits him, and he starts sinking. The good news is Jesus is always there when we're sinking. We don't have to worry about, you know, sinking so far we can't be restored because God always scoops us up. He does whisper in our ears, oh, ye of little faith, but he scoops us up. And he says, you realize you're going to have to do this one again. (laughs) I promise I'll believe next time. I won't look at the wind or the waves. He said, okay, well, we'll see. Because there's another test coming. Because God is invested in you learning to walk in this power. It's crucial. So when you talk about the cross, when you talk about all Jesus has done for us, don't forget the purpose of all of this is so you can experience resurrection power. That's what it's all about. And so we have the death, we have the resurrection, and the third phase is the life. Life is learning to live in the life and power of Christ's resurrection. The life is learning to live in life and the power of Christ's resurrection. A lot of people know about the death. We know about the resurrection because we celebrate it once a year. We may only remember it once a year, but we celebrate it once a year during Easter. But we have to learn that it's an everyday thing to learn to live in the life and power of the resurrection. Death is saying no to self. Resurrection is saying yes to God's will. But life is learning to live in God's will and kingdom. And that's the end result. That's where we're going. Faith is an important part of this because power comes from action. Faith is an important part of this process because power, the power of the resurrection, God's power, comes after action. I wish it came before, but it does not. That's why it says you appropriate it by faith. What does that mean? That means you have to act before the power comes. That means if you need resources, they're not coming before you need them. (laughs) They're actually going to come after you need them. I wish it was different. 
Many times we'd be going to get ready to go to Africa and we'd be counting it down two weeks, one week, three days, two days, one day, and then the money would come. I remember one time God said, uh, we were praying and I think somebody, we were at a prayer meeting, someone said, you're supposed to go to this meeting tomorrow night. I was like, really? I said, yeah, I feel like that's what God told me. I don't know why, but I said, all right. So I go to the meeting. And I run to this guy, and I tell him I'm getting ready to go to Africa. And he, he said, you are? He said, yeah. He said, How, you got everything you need? And I said, no. He said, well, I, got, I feel like there's somebody I'm supposed to introduce you to tomorrow. Really? Okay. Can you meet me here? Yeah. The guy ended up giving me $15,000. I said, I'm so thankful I went to the meeting that night and met the guy who said, I need to take you to another meeting. But that's, that's the word you hear, and that's when you act on that. That's when the resources will come. Faith comes when you step on the water, not when you're in the boat. We have to remember that. And the key to faith is hearing that word from God. You got a problem, you got a crisis, you're going through something. You just need a word from God. You need a word where God says, here's what I want you to do. And then you have to yield to it. How do you yield to that word? By acting on it. By doing whatever it says. In that case, it was go to that meeting. Remember what the word says? Man does not live by... In that, but by every word that comes from... That word in the Greek is rhema. The spoken word. Man lives by the spoken word of God. And I believe if you live in the, the rhema word, matter of fact, I can attest to you that if you get up in the morning and you get a word from God, that you almost don't even need to eat physical food. That the rhema words on a daily basis will feed your soul. That's the power of it. And rhema or manna comes daily. And it comes early in the morning. Because when the manna was by the noontime, the manna would all melt away. So you don't get manna late in the day. You don't get manna in the afternoon. You get manna in the morning. And you get that manna and it's sustenance to your soul. That rhema is what allows me to live a life in resurrection power. The life of the cross, a lot of people wonder what that is. It's not doing what you think you should do. It's doing what the Spirit of God tells you to do. I remember one of my favorite stories was about a Chinaman and uh, he owned a rice paddy on a, on a, in a rice paddy field, and it was on a mountainside. And every day, you know, they'd build their little walls up, mud walls up around the rice paddy. And every day, they'd get up, and there was a river that would run down. And so every farmer was responsible to pump the water out of the river into his rice paddy because they had to be flooded every day so the rice would grow. And so the guy would get up five, six o'clock, and he'd get up, and they had a bicycle there as a pump, and he'd, he'd ride that bike and pump his field full of water. And then one day he got up, and he looked out there, and all the water was gone out of his field, and he wondered, what? I said, I know. I punched. He'd go out there and have to pump it again. Next day he gets up, he'd pump that water in his field, and he'd get up a little bit later, and the water was gone again. He said, what is going on? So the next day he pumps, gets up early, pumps that water back in his field, and he stays up and watches what happened. And in about an hour, the neighbor, his, the other guy who had the rice paddy under him, would go up and just break the walls down of his little thing and drain all the water out of his field into his. And so he was getting his field watered, and 
So it made the guy so mad. He said, you know what? I'm going to go. Call, I'm going to bust that guy. I'm going to go and knock him upside the head. I'm going to tear his feel up. He thought of all these awesome things that he could do to get retribution. He said, but you know what? He said, I, I, my brother is a Christian. He said, I'm going to go to my brother and talk to him and see what God's saying about this. So he goes to his brother and he tells him the story. His brother said, well, let's pray. So they pray. And after a few minutes of prayer, the brother looks at him and says, you know what? I, th I feel like I just heard God. I said, what did God say? He said, God said, when you get up in the morning, don't just pump your feel, but pump the guy below you's feel too. He said, what? He said, I'm ready to take this guy out. He said, you want me to pump his feel and my feel? He's been stealing water from me for like two weeks. He said, I really think that's what God's saying. He's like, okay. So he gets up in the morning, he pumps his feel, and he pumps the guy's feel below him and goes back to bed. A couple hours later, there's a knock at the door. And it's the man's field that had been stealing his water. And he said, did you fill my water with, fill my field with water? He said, yes. He said, why'd you do that? He said, well, I felt like God told me to. My brother's a Christian, and we prayed, and God told me what to do. He said, you know, I've been stealing your water. He said, I know that. He said, well, I'd like to meet your brother. And so they both go to his brother, and both of them get saved. That's the way of the cross, church. It's not to respond the way we'd like. It's not to act the way we think. It's to say, God, what do you say? What is your solution? How should I handle this? And that's what the way of the cross is all about. The way of the cross doesn't mean we lay around crucified or we, we die to our desires. The cross means we yield to God's will. And because of that, we live in the life and the power of the resurrection. Understanding and appropriating the cross is two different things. Understanding what Christ has done is one thing, but appropriating what he's done is a totally different thing. There are two aspects. Remember, we've talked about this before. There's the penalty of sin and there's the power of sin. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says this, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. If you've received the truth of the crucifixion, then walk in it. How do we live in this life we got through Christ's death on the cross? We choose to yield to the Spirit. We choose to yield to God. You know, we talked this morning about the process of the self-life, and we talked about how Paul in Romans 7, 15 through 19 talks about what I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, that's what I keep doing. So he's describing this problem with the flesh. It's alive and well. If you feed it, it will frustrate you all your life. Let me say it this way. If you don't yield to God, if you don't get the word in the morning, and you don't obey it, you will fr be frustrated all your life. You will live in the flesh all your life. No matter how much you know the truth, if you don't yield to the Spirit, if you don't take the time to get up in the morning and pray and learn to hear from God, you'll be frustrated all your life. But when you hear from God, and just like in that story where the Chinaman was pumping fields and he wanted to go bust the guy across the mouth, and the, and the Holy Spirit says, no, go pump water in his field too. That makes no sense, and I certainly don't feel like doing that. I don't want to do that. I want to get revenge. God says, no, that's not the solution to this problem. 
you, you go and pump both fields. And so we have a, we have a, a call, if you will, to not just, and that's what he said when I read you that verse in Colossians, don't just know about the truth. Walk in the truth. Live in the power. Live in the resurrection. That's why Paul ends after that passage in Romans 7 where he's explaining the frustration of the flesh life. We come to Romans 8, verse 5. He says, For those who live according to the flesh, here's the answer, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. And here's the thing. If you desire to obey the Spirit, then He's going to speak to you. He's going to speak to you. But if you say, well, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do what I want to do. Or I'm not going to take the time to hear. I'm just going to do... I didn't, did you pray? No, didn't pray. Guess what? You've locked yourself in to the flesh. You don't pray. You don't wait on God. You don't take the time to hear. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, I ain't getting that word. I don't have time. I'm really busy. Guess what? You're not living in the power. And that's why you see some Christians that come into church like this. Hey, how you doing? You doing all right? Oh, yeah, I'm making it. I'm here. I'm real tired, though. Because I've been in the flesh all day. And it's hard. That's the way we, Christians act. I'm so tired. And yet we have all this power available to us. It's so easy. It's like we got a car out here. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to drive my car home. I'm going to get behind it and push it. Will you help me? Now, we'll get there eventually. But when we get there, we'll all be on our knees crawling for the door. When all we got to do is get inside and sit down in this nice, comfortable seat and turn the key and just drive home. That's like being in the Spirit. It's like being in the resurrection. You ever sat at home and gone, I don't want to go to church? Is God telling you that? You ever got up in the morning and said, here's my Bible. I don't want to read it today. I want to go watch TV. Is God telling you that? When I yield to the flesh, when I yield to my self-desires, it locks me out of the power and the life of the resurrection. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your truth, for your love, and especially for your work on the cross. Thank you, God. You died on the cross and you opened that door to the resurrection. You open that door to a life of power and purpose. Thank you, God, that when I yield to that resurrection, when I yield to that faith, when I yield to that word, when I yield to your direction, I experience the power in the life that you purchased through your death and resurrection. Thank you so much, God, that when we celebrate it, we don't just celebrate the cross, we also celebrate the resurrection. And you know how we celebrate it? Because we live in those words, in that direction, in the desires of the Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for what you've provided for us. Thank you that I don't ever have to be tired again. I don't ever have to be weary again. I don't have to have to be burdened again if I'll but take the time to set my mind on what the Spirit desires. Lord, we repent for all the times where we've missed it, where we failed to get the Word, where we failed to take the time to hear what the Spirit desires. We've wrestled with the flesh because we didn't hear what the Spirit says. We fed the flesh instead of feeding the Spirit. 
God, we repent tonight and we receive the truth and we walk in a new light and a new power.